To the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the Venerable Master, the Great Assembly, Omitopo. Uh, <clears throat> they asked me to talk, so I have to talk. But I can uh, just tell you a story because we're, uh, Dharma Master Sher was telling you about his experiences with Sherpa teaching us. Uh, when you're being taught by a master as a Sangin, it's a lot different than as a layman as I found out when I left home. <laughs> so, so our teacher, uh, <clears throat> I forgot my train of thought. Oh, uh, he would never uh, beat us or anything. He was never physical with us. Like in the old days, back in, the, back in old China, they used to get, <laughs> disciples used to get beaten a lot by their teachers. But our teacher beat us another way. <laughs> He has other ways of getting to us. <laughs> so, uh, when I was, uh, we left home, Hung Shur and I, in 76, and I think it was 1980 or 81, the master said, okay, I'm gonna go on, uh, we're gonna go on a delegation to Asia, we're going to Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Malaysia. And uh, Sir Vu invited, uh, he says, do you want to go? He told me, Sir Fu said to me, and I said, oh, yes, Sir Fu. Good. I get to go on a vacation. <laughs> I get to go see all these great countries. I've never seen any of them. And uh, so I thought it was going to be really cool. We get to travel around with Sir Fu and look at, go on sightseeing tours. It's going to be great. I'm going to really enjoy myself. But it uh, turns out it didn't kind of work that way. Because the master, uh, it turns out he uses those trips as a, as a teaching tool <laughs> to teach his sanghas, especially. And so, as soon as we got on the airplane, he began teaching us <laughs> all kinds of dharmas. And uh, well, we got to Taiwan first, and it, in those days, back in the early 80s, they were electing uh, a new Buddhist leader. They wanted to, they, I guess they got jealous of the Pope, the Catholic Pope, so they wanted to have a, a Buddhist equivalent, I guess. I don't know what the thinking was, but they got this uh, one, I guess, I guess the uh, deal was already done, but they're pretending to go through the motions of electing a new Pope, a new Buddhist Pope. And uh, so Shifu complied. And as soon as we got to the, we stayed in the Grand Hotel in Taipei. I said, oh, wow, we get to stay in the Grand Hotel. It's really cool. So we go in there, and all these people, there were thousands of people there. It was really crowded. And as soon as Shifu came into the lobby, it was immediately just, um, people came around him because his reputation had preceded him. And... Uh, we're bowing, mostly lay people were all bowing, and, and the Sanghans too were all bowing to Shifu. So the master said, okay, I'm going to my room right now. And then he told Hung Guan and myself, former Hung Guan, he says, you two, I want you to go out and scout. And, and then he told Hung Yin and Hung Dao, who are also former Hung Yin and Hung Dao, who were on the trip, and they, he told them as well. I said, you two also, go out and scout. Keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. And uh, we we're going to have a lot of conferences and things. He said, go to all those conferences and just sit there, be polite, but uh, don't offer your opinion. But I want to hear everything. <laughs> Come back and report. <laughs> and he says, I'm not going to leave my room because I don't want to make the other uh, hufas, the other, uh, the other Dharma masters jealous of me. So I'll stay in my room. So... Shifu stayed in his room and he sent us out as a screening party. <laughs> so we were the screening party. And uh, of course, we still practice the practice of wearing our, our, our ease, our robes. And in Taiwan and in China, they, they don't do that. They just wear their pals, just this undergarment here, which is... So we kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. Everybody's looking at us like, what's with these people? <laughs> They're wearing their ease. And uh, we had uh, Taiwanese, we had Koreans, Japanese, we had Tibetans, Sri Lankans, Thais, everybody. There was a whole pile of people there. 
all kinds of sangha. And they were eating three times a day. They had these great big luxurious meals the hotel was putting out. And they had meat, they had onions, garlic, meat. Everybody was eating this stuff. And it, was, it was really hard to practice because they <laughs> we tried to find something we can eat at lunchtime that didn't have onions, garlic, or meat in it. And it was really weird to me because I said, well, this is supposed to be a Buddhist. <laughs> this is a Buddhist gathering. I don't understand. <laughs> so that was uh, quite a shock. But uh, from there, we took a bunch of buses. They took, I don't know, at least 20 or 30 buses, probably more than that, full of people. And we were going to go all the way down to Foguanshan, which is the southern part of the island. So we went from the north part of the island all the way to the southern part of the island. I don't remember how long a drive that is. Six? Yeah, that would make sense. So halfway through the trip, we stopped for lunch. And they'd already prepared the lunch in this great big park. The la laity had gone ahead, and they set up tents and everything. It was really quite a production. And they had these big tables with the Lazy Susans on them for all the different groups to sit at. So uh, we got off the bus and sat with Shifu because our own delegation was fairly sizable as usual when we go overseas. We used 20 or 30 people. And, and the Sanghas, I think we had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, something like six or seven Sanghans. And we all sat around this big table with Shifu. And uh, of course, they fed you like princes there, like we were royalty. So they bring in uh, all this great food, and they start turning the lazy Susan around. Everybody can take some food. But I noticed they had this big pile of uh, spring rolls. So I'm saying, oh, that looks really good. <laughs> so as they came to me, I said, well, I'll, I'll take a couple. And they said, well, maybe I'll. I'll take a couple more. Said, well, may maybe one more. Meanwhile, Shurfu is looking at me. <laughs> then finally he goes, look at him, look at him. He's taking all our spring rolls. We're not going to have any. I said, oh, no. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I turned bright red, and I couldn't take it. I finally jumped up from the table and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> and Sherpa was roaring with laughter. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know where to run. Where am I going to run to? I don't, I'm, in, I'm in a foreign country. Where, where am I going? I don't even know where to go. So sooner or later, I had to come back to the table again. So I slunk back there, all defeated, and sat in my chair waiting to get scolded. And Sherpa had piled my... my uh, bowl and dish, dishes up with spring rolls. He, it's a huge mountain. Says, Look, I get some more for you. It's okay. You can have all those. <laughs> so, this how to, this how Shifu taught us. You know, he's, he's, this is how we got to, taught not to be so greedy. <laughs> goes, but this is his method. He would, he would wait for you to mess up, and then he'd just pile it on. And um, it, was, it wasn't just me. He did that poor Hung Wu. We had a, a Shami with us who had just left home, and Shifu just constantly scolded him for every little thing. Where's the bags? Where are my bags? You stole my bag. Go get my bag. He'd run off and say, why are you so slow? Hurry up. He's so constantly scolding him. He said, what did he do wrong? What's going on? And so... My little joyous vacation was tr quickly turning into a nightmare. I, did, I said, oh my, I didn't think I was going to go through this. I didn't know I was getting into. <laughs> then I realized Shufu has us. He has us in the palm of his hands to really teach us. He knows we can't run away. Where are we going to run? So he can really pile it on. So he really got into all of our afflictions really quickly to show us where they are. So he had a really interesting way of teaching people. <laughs> Every time we would give, Shifu would lecture every night, people would offer him a place to lecture, and we'd go, like we usually do on delegations, we'd go lecture every night. But it, he would always do it this way. He'd have everybody in the, uh, you know, not, not the entire delegation, but he'd usually have the sanghas, the bhikshus, the bhikshunis talk first, 
And then after that, Shufa would speak. So we did that every night uh, when we were on that trip. And then, which was very unusual. People always thought, oh, it's just the master is going to speak, but not, not sure if we wanted us to all learn how to speak Dharma. And uh, then we got to Hong Kong, and Hong Kong, uh, that was my first time there, but we went up to Buddhist Lecture Hall, which is a small, uh, maybe half the size of, hang, this, of this uh, half can. And uh, the... Uh, Big Shunis, and mostly were Big Shunis there at the time, all came up and bowed to Shufu, and all he did was scold them. I, <laughs> the whole time I was there, he did nothing but scold them. I said, wow, he's never done that before in Gold Mountain, but o over here is completely different. He's like completely transformed. And I said, he's a completely different teacher over here. I realized he teaches everybody according to the conditions, you know, according to their conditions. And uh, We really learned a lot on that trip. And then after that, we went to Malaysia, and uh, that was the first time there, and we didn't have uh, any way places of our own there. Uh, we didn't have any uh, monasteries or temples or anything, so they rented a hall for Shifu to give a lecture. So Shifu gave a lecture, and then we were talking about uh, people giving, making donations. The other night, well, people would come up with their red envelopes, and there might be one or two pennies you know, Malaysian pennies, copper pennies in them. And uh, at the end of the lecture, Shifu would, got up and he says, uh, would say, oh, you cheapskates, all of you make these donations, one or two pennies. What kind of donation is that? What, do you think you're getting married for that? You think you're getting blessings? <laughs> so, <clears throat> but he, he saw the conditions of the people who gave, you know. He says, and then, but he brought up one envelope and he said, this envelope here only has one dime in it, but the person who donated was very poor and that person has true merit and blessings. And, um, and then the next night he lectured, there was a young, really young girl in there, she's in her maybe 12 years old, who couldn't, uh, couldn't talk, she's a mute, she couldn't talk, had something wrong, it was a birth, at birth she couldn't speak. And Shufu uh, recited for her in the assembly. And then she started, ah, started talking. It completely freaked everybody out. And, uh, and then the next day, this, hundreds of people were coming in with crutches, wheelchairs, <laughs> gurneys. Wheel, yeah, uh, literally. And she says, I'm not healing anybody else. Get out. That's it. No more. Then he told us a story about when he was on the ferry boat when he was young. He was a very young monk and he had the ability to cure illness back then. And people would come by and he'd tap them with his cane. And they, you know, they, maybe they had a limp or they would, he, he would tap them and they would get rid of their limp. They would, he was keeling them right and left. And then the, the ferry got into a big storm. They almost, they almost sank. And he said the dragons and all the gods and spirits and all the heavenly beings were very upset because he was upsetting the, the yin and yang of heaven and earth by doing this. And he prayed to Guan Yin to forgive him and, and that he would not be so arrogant in the future to do that. And he said he learned his lesson. <laughs> you don't just go around healing people right and left. And... Um, you have to understand causes and conditions before you do such things. And so uh, he explained that dharma to those people at, in that lecture. That was really interesting. So we learned a lot on that trip.